Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I welcome you today to Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together, a regular program that comes on every two weeks where we talk about the economy, the government, and other fun things that make Hawaii what Hawaii is today. I'm delighted to have a friend joining me today, someone who's been on our program in the past, someone who understands the economics that are taking place here in the state of Hawaii. And he's going to clear up a few misconceptions that we have, but more than that, we're just going to have fun talking about the economy. My friend, Paul Brubaker, principal of TZ Economics. Dr. Brubaker is one of the leading economic analysts in the state. He's worked in a variety of corporate settings as well as private research. And today he's going to share some of his, what we call, mana'o, or his words of wisdom on the economy. Paul, welcome to the program. Good to see you again, please. Well, it's good to see you. Let me just ask you this question. When you were a little kid, three or four years old, and others were imagining becoming spacemen or firemen, <laughs> did you say, I want to become an economic and analyst? <laughs> Uh, not when I was that young, but actually when I got to high school, I started actually thinking about it sort of in the back of my mind. And then I went and majored in other things, but eventually I came back around to it. Well, really, I invited you on the show today just to talk story. You yeah, know, there's sure. some current events taking place in terms of the volcano, oh, eruption yeah. on the Big Island, housing boom, yeah. and uh, our right. president's trade wars that, that are <laughs> taking place all across Europe and uh, down into Mexico. We'll talk a bit about that, but before that, just for everybody's sake, what is economics? How would you define that? Well, sort of the textbook definition, it's the study of how things are allocated across unlimited wants, given that, you know, nothing's free or nothing's infinitely available. So we have scarce resources and we have to figure out exactly how they get to different competing ends. That's right. And the idea is how would you design mechanisms to efficiently do the allocation? You know, when it comes to economics, there's some big principles that we could kind of scribble down on crib notes before we go into our SAT test. One of them is the idea of supply and demand. Mm. How would you explain that? That's such a foundational principle in economics. Uh, what would you say that really means to the layman? You know, we observed that one really efficient way to solve the allocation problem is for producers to respond to the signals that prices give to them from the market and for consumers who are looking at the same prices to base their consumption decisions on the same prices. And so if both of them independently are making individualistic decisions based on prices, sort of miraculously in the market, things tend to sort themselves out. So if I have three apples and you've got two uh, pears, and uh, I really want those pears, I, I, I'd be willing to give you the three apples and you'd like to get three apples for the two pairs, and we have that exchange, and we're both happy, and we eat our fruit. Uh, that's uh, copacetic. That's that's how it works out. Sure. Fine. I mean, even better if I knew some guy down the street who had you know three tilapia, and I could do a third trade with him. So yeah. So that's how the market works in, in a pure sense. What happens when Big Brother comes in, the the, the bully in the neighborhood, or? The uh, manager of the, the big Luna of the, the block comes in and says, well, wait a minute. Uh, you, you can't give three for two. You've got to have some kind <laughs> yeah. of equity over here. So we're going to adjust the price for you. Yeah, sure. I mean, it depends on the situation because we do observe that large hierarchical organizations coexist with markets. And so there's a place for the Luna. But, um, you know, in general, um, what people have found over the centuries is that markets are really efficient ways of organizing allocation, production, and consumption. Um, whereas, um, you know, dictates from people who we think know more don't work out as well. I mean, the ones we elect to office yeah. and who wear fancy or, 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 you know, had, you know, had a bigger hammer. <laughs> so there's this term that sometimes gets villainized. It's generally not well understood, but we've been referring a little bit to it called the free market. What is your idea of a free market? Well, so I use the term market because uh -huh. markets also have problems associated with them. But yeah, generally speaking, if people are free to interact in markets, allocation has a tendency uh, to be efficient. Um, it's even better if you're um, attentive to the problems that are associated with market-based allocation. And um, you know, given the choice, um, make, you're, you're making decisions about how to approach 
a, a production or consumption or allocation decision wisely, you know, faced with the alternatives. How well is the market working in Hawaii? The, the kind of ideal market you and I were talking about where we could just trade with each other without much interference. Uh, do, do, is that the way things work in the Hawaii economy? You know, it's not the Soviet Union or Maoist uh -huh. okay. uh, China after the Cultural Revolution, but um, I might, you know, I would say as a generalization, there's a tendency uh, for uh, intervention in markets that tends to jam up some of the efficiency gains we could get. Could you give um, an example of, of how the government may interfere in our corporate or our free, free market in Hawaii? Well, the fashionable one now is governments making rules that are essentially production quotas for home building. Thou okay. shalt build X percent of your units to be affordable, and then we're going to define affordability in terms of some income measure. So if a developer is building a building down in Kaka'ako, the government sets up a rule that says su such a percentage of your units has to be affordable. Yeah, but I mean, it can be, a, you know, a guy building 11 houses on the island of Kauai has to jump through the same hoops, yeah. Well, you know, that happens a lot on some of the neighbor islands, Maui, Kauai. Uh, what, what, what impact does it have ultimately on, on the, the prices that we experience as consumers? Well, prices in the housing market are going to be what they are regardless of, you know, what goes on uh, in uh, prices in the existing home market, um, you know, new homes are a relatively small portion of what's out there and what's even what's transacting. But um, the problem is that these, the cost of compliance, the cost of jumping through the hoops to get your, your project to pencil out in a way that's both profitable and it adheres to the um, requirements being imposed on you as a builder, as a developer, um, you know, makes housing less affordable and means that there's less of it produced as a consequence of the intervention. That's the cost of regulation. It's essentially the cost of regulation. Now, I know you're familiar with the work of Professor David Callies at the University sure, of yeah. Hawaii. Uh, one of his uh, very well-known books is the, the Price of Paradise. Uh, regulating, uh, regula paradise. regulating paradise. That's Correct. right. Yeah. In which he talks about what you've just said here, how, how regulations actually r drive up prices and ultimately make things less affordable and even somewhat more scarce. He, he argues that there's an artificial scarcity of land, which, as we were talking about earlier through supply and demand, would drive up the price uh, and the cost for the consumer. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, Professor Callies is an expert in, in the law of um, uh, inclusionary zoning and um, um, exactions and the kinds of interventions we were talking about. Um, as an economist, I, I tend to look at things a little bit differently, but I think um, in, in the cases you were talking about, there, there was a period in the 70s and 80s when a lot of current regulation began to be developed, and now it's sort of reached a mature state, um, really in the last decade, where all of the counties and the state as well, through its housing regulators, have adopted fairly challenging rules from a compliance standpoint. So it makes it very difficult to build, and we haven't had as much building in this decade as we've had in the past, as much home building. Now, I don't know if there's any evil genius behind this, or it just is the sum total of all the regulations uh, having an impact, but one of the things that Professor Kelly says is that, in reality, we develop on only 4% or less of the total landmass of the state of Hawaii. About 96% about is not urbanized or developed, and we could easily open up just a sliver, a tiny sliver of that, and massively increase the amount of land available. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, I mean, there's about four million acres of land in, in Hawaii, um, two million of which are in conservation and two million of which are in agricultural designation. So there's a very thin sliver, I think it's about 200,000 acres, of which maybe 50,000 are, um, you know, actually urbanized. So it's a, it's a very small portion of the land mass. But the economics, of course, are consistent with some of that because, for example, um, it's not just about space, but it's time. So if you think about the commuting time to get to employment centers, you know, once you get an hour away from work, it's kind of not worth it. 
What happens on our islands is that it's a combination of geography, steep slopes and water bodies that constrain the developable part of land that can be urbanized, and, and then the burden of regulatory intervention that makes the development more costly that you know, creates uh, sure. the environment that we were talking about. But urban agglomeration is going to happen anyway because it's efficient for people, particularly in a services and information producing economy. It's, it's beneficial for people to agglomerate in their workspace or workplaces, right? They, they co-locate for work and then they make location decisions about where they live depending on their budget, their preferences. Are they okay with sitting in traffic for an hour? You know, some people prefer to be close to work and walk. You know, if we're imagining a future in terms of providing more space for housing, what do you think is the better option for Hawaii? Space that goes upward vertically in terms of high density areas like Kaka'ako or space that yeah. goes out horizontally in terms of places like Mililani or right. Waikele? Well, it kind of doesn't matter what I think because you can, you can see the spatial valuation gradient, right? Mm -hmm. It's more expensive at the center and it's cheaper on the periphery. And as I say, people sort of sort themselves out and, and, and make their own decisions about you know, how much they want to spend on this versus that. But to your point about vertical space, right? To arbitrarily cut things off at 400 square feet because that's the size of Walter Dodd's building or some other, I don't know where they. <laughs> Careful, he may be watching. <laughs> I, hey, he's a good guy, but you know, really, that's all we're going to do. We're never going to build another building that high. So, um, yeah, that seems a little strange to me. I mean, okay, so here's the bumper sticker version, you know, uh -huh. like um, keep the country country, make the city city. So the bumper sticker version is density is proximity, proximity is mobility. Ooh. For so some you people, see the, yeah. the Kakako development as a, a positive thing for Hawaii, and perhaps we should have a little bit more of that in certain defined spaces. Dude, the way I would put it is it makes perfect sense for people to live in high density mm -hmm. habitation close to their employment centers if that's what they want and are willing to pay for it. It makes no sense at all to me to force a pattern uh, that's you know, not supported in the market. I'm just glad I don't have to drive out of downtown anymore to go to a Whole Foods. You know, some people are cool <laughs> with living the suburban dream and going out to Foodland and the, you know, in the regional shopping mall. And other people, you know, like the hustle and bustle of an urban core. And sure, now that Whole Paychecks is there, right, it's a hangout. I've actually been there. I, actually act I haven't actually been into the supermarket part because they've got a bar out front and I never get past the bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the most common observation about the economics of housing is the rising cost of homes. Yeah. It has been a relentless and continuous r r uh, curve. Well, so what uh, yeah, okay. do you say to those who suggest that we're in a housing bubble and that we're going to see a crash coming. Okay, yeah, well, let's tap things out a little bit. There's no bubble this time. Okay. Okay, so the curve you're talking about is just the values exponentiating or rising mm -hmm. at a constant percent rate, which is about 4 or 5 percent, uh -huh. unless you adjust for inflation, in which case is about 2 or 2.5 two percent over long, 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 long sweeps of time. So that's just... You, you want a competitive rate of return, otherwise why would you own the house, right, when you can own a treasury bond right. that yields you 3%. So, so those decisions are, um, that individual investors are making are being guided by a broad variety of returns in other asset classes as well as, as, well as housing. Well, but, I'm going to cut you off just for a yeah. moment here. We're going to take a minute break oh, okay, sure, yeah. and come back, and then we're going to talk about what we can do about the rising costs of housing, if anything at all, or what we can do in order to make more housing available for yeah. here in the state Which of Which are separate questions. Yes. And we'll come back to both of those questions with Paul Brubaker, who's got some fascinating ideas on the subject. I'm Kili'i Akina on Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests 
talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. の日本語でお届けする。こんにちは、ハワイの日本語放送のコスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティ、ハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお
the opportunity to take advantage of their skill set and, and make a decision about you know, a job with better income or even with the same income having a job that allows them to afford a less expensive home in another place. I think one of the great things about America is that we have that kind of mobility. Interesting thought. I'm going to think this through a little yeah, bit more I, I turn, and look, look I turn at the some thing, of the data, because what you're yeah. saying could, is potentially promising. I, I that, turned the thing on its head completely yeah, that from Hawaii the way other could people. be just as affordable as it's always been, given uh, the, uh, you know, our, our use of resources. To, I'm saying even more strongly than that, that Hawaii is as affordable as it's ever been. Now, I've, now there are times when it was worse. But it's rarely been much better than it is now. Well, this now. could be the era of great opportunity then, especially given the technology. And yes, except for other things that aren't. And I want to turn Yeah, it's yes, the other things. Here's Housing one, is not. One for yeah, those yeah. who are in a localized place, and, the, right. and that is on the, the neighbor islands, where, where there's a, an especially high crunch now, particularly yeah. on the big island. Now, I've done three or four mainland trips in the last month and a half, and the number one question people ask me has to deal with Kilauea volcano erupting. Mm. Paul, uh, how is that affecting our economy, both locally on the island and in yeah, the state? Yeah, well, I mean, at least they're not talking about super ferry anymore. But so <laughs> uh, what I would say about this, this is sort of the Iniki effect, right? Mm -hmm. Bad for Kauai, right? Iniki, Hurricane Iniki, bad for Kauai, not obvious in any of the other data. And so by the same token, the latest phase of the 1983 Pu'u'u'u, I mean, this is the right. same eruption, right, going on for 35 years. The latest phase of that eruption has, you know, it's destroyed 600 homes, displaced thousands of people, um, and, um, you know, ruined a number of uh, primarily agricultural businesses. But, um, yeah, is the state as a whole? Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, has the tourist economy been hurt by that's, the Kilauea volcano That's eruptions? the thing. I, on the big island, without question. But when I look at the, the numbers, I look at daily passenger accounts statewide, people are still getting on the plane. So if they're not going to the big island, I, and I know some people are going to the big island, but, you know, many that's people right. who um, would prefer not to expose themselves to air quality issues or whatever are making decisions substituting other destinations. Yeah, and not, not to belittle the tragic loss of the residents uh, in the area, it, could it be that the coverage of the volcano eruptions is actually doing more for marketing Hawaii than the Hawaii Visitor Bureau has done through its advertising? You know, I mean, we're in the news almost every night in virtually every news market across the country <laughs> and in many international markets. Bro, don't even get me started. You and me, we should go down there tomorrow, build a 60-foot viewing platform, and charge $10 for people to ride an elevator to the top and look at the eruption from a distance. What I hear them doing is ticketing people for loitering. So, I mean, don't get me started on that. Wouldn't, I mean, shouldn't we do that? Let's go make a place where you can actually see vent number eight, you know well, what I mean? Paul, you and charge I think there might be some community members who'd have some responses to you. And he, this is one of the things that Hawaii, We all make hui with the Pahoa community, go. bro. All Pahoa come down. We go build tower. <laughs> let, let me switch gears before we go, because yeah. this has just been a potpourri of opinions sure, that, sure. that we've shared. Uh, today, uh, attention has been put back again on the President Trump's tariffs. Uh, not yeah. only is he increasing the tariffs on steel you know, from Europe uh, and from Mexico and Canada, uh, he, he's slapped tariffs onto about, what, $50 billion worth of Chinese goods. We're starting to see some retaliation. What, Gee, are, you, you what, what are your thoughts uh, on how effective President Trump's tariff plan is? Well, if it's, if the point was to make things worse, he's doing a great job. I mean, that's right? Build, build barriers to trade, and that'll make things worse. So if that was the objective, I'm sure it's working out just great. I mean, we're, we're just in the first round of tit-for-tat countervailing tariffs, right? This is, this is round one of a 12-round, you know, knockdown, drag out. I mean, when this President, is just the beginning. When President Trump uh, came into office, he, he, he put a, paid a lot of attention to, on his uh, micro intervention in companies to help jobs stay in America. What do you think about Harley Davidson's recent announcement that it's going to be better for them to build their Harleys in Europe than 
uh, or many of them in Europe than to build them here and ship them I mean, over. I mean, I mean, you had to see that one coming, right? Mm -hmm. You make steel or aluminum components to motor vehicular manu manufacturing more expensive. Why would you not take do the production somewhere where it's less expensive? Was, I mean, I'm just saying, isn't that obvious that that was going to be the first thing that happened from the first round of tariffs? And as I say, we're in round one. We're just getting the retaliatory announcements from our former trading partners. And then, you know, what, it becomes a game of one-upsmanship. One it's like a game of chicken, right? To see who veers off and so we don't have a head-on collision. Because that's, that's the game that Trump initiated and that the world now is playing. Well, let's go back to what we were talking about at the very beginning. Yeah. We were trying to define economics. You talked about markets and behavior. And it sounds to me as though there's something predictable about markets. Uh, the, there are some principles that can be applied to understanding what's going on with the trade uh, d tariffs that President Trump is imposing. Yeah, so the, the lesson has been, we've got at least 200 years of clear history pointing in this, this direction. If you mitigate some of the external problems that can be associated with markets, they're still the most efficient way, they're the best way to do allocation, whether that's, you know, between apples and pears or fish and poi or countries or, you know, continents, right? And why you would go in there and intervene to make markets a more, I mean, a less effective way of solving that allocation problem, I do not understand. What's the ultimate impact upon Hawaii uh, of these trade? Uh, so, ironically, the, the, most of this is focused on merchandise mm -hmm. because I don't think these people know what they're actually doing. Most trade is actually in services these days, right? The, the, and most manuf merchandise trade is actually in components not the raw materials. So it's intra-industry trade that's come to dominate merchandise trade, and it's services and information, intellectual property, and blah, 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 that's the rest of the current account. They're focused on the one part, you know, living out the dream of 1947, when I, people actually, you know, we made sugar and sent it to the mainland, and they gave us cotton so we could make clothes. It's not like, that's not the world we live in anymore. Mm. I'm going to close with this question just coming from left field a bit. Last time you were here, you, you shared a bit about a research project you did in terms of quantifying Hawaii's agricultural output. Mm. And at about that time, uh, the state governor, uh, Governor Ige, had made a promise that within three years we would double the, the agricultural output of the state of Hawaii. So just off the top of your head, yeah. how are we doing? So I haven't heard any updates on that goal. Right, I don't think you're going to. To be fair to those guys, they weren't actually measuring agricultural output effectively okay. for a variety of reasons. You mean they didn't have the metrics at that time? Well, they, did, they, they took away the money to fund the uh, effort the to bureau compile the data. Yeah, so compiles the data. It's been a, you know, it's the recession, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, since we talked, the sugar, the last sugar plantation has closed, and the corn seed, you know, maize uh, breeding genetics-based industry has shrunk because of falling grain prices. And um, so they're, they're hoping that, you know, food self-sufficiency um, will somehow, you know, come back. okay, it's not going to happen. It's about this big. It doesn't really matter. It matters to the farmers, and we love local stuff. But it's about this big in economic importance. Hmm. Yeah, maybe a half percentage point, one half of one percentage point of GDP. Well, obviously, so. our state is going to have to take a hard look at, at what it can do if it wants to increase agricultural output. And the first place to begin, of course, is learning how to measure that. Well, and a big part of it is keeping enough places where you can do things that people haven't actually invented yet. Mm -hmm. The kind of agriculture we're going to do in Hawaii is things we don't know exist yet because, you know, the innovative people haven't That's right. come up well, with I'll that. Well, I'll have to invite you back to talk about AI and technology oh, and so yeah. forth. Paul, good talking with you today. Thanks, Thanks Kayla. for your yeah. ideas. My guest today is Paul uh, Brubaker who is the principal of TZ Economics. If you need economics done for you, just look up TZ Economics. <laughs> I'm Kaylee Iadina Google it. <laughs> on Hawaii Together. We'll see you next time on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.